Hello, everybody. Okay, it's after lunch, so I'm going to try to be as loud, boisterous, and silly as I possibly can be without getting thrown out in the road. Um, first of all, um, I think we should all thank Linda Hutchison Jafar for doing this again, and her whole team. I think it's very admirable what they're doing here. And I'm waiting for my PowerPoint presentation. So I'll kill a little time by, yes, my name really is Stephen Greenleaf. And yes, it is OK to laugh about that. In fact, I encourage it, because environmental activism and environmental awareness can get pretty depressing. And uh, any opportunity to laugh and be a little bit jolly is fine by me. Um, so what I'm going to try to do with my presentation today is inform you a little, hopefully scare you to death, and then come out with, at the end, with some positives and some things that we can do. Because I'm supposed to present on, can youth do anything? What can youth do? The answer is, not only yes, can you, but you better. Because my generation and the generation before me have really messed things up thoroughly. I, I apologize for my little part in it. We all could have done a lot better, and we have failed. So there's my contact information. Uh, please feel free to contact me if I can help you with research or anything. I don't know all the answers, but I have a lot of very smart friends. Uh, next slide, please. It's a little bit about Caribbean Institute of Sustainability. We're a nonprofit. Mostly we do training and education. We do some consulting work. And I try to help little NGOs every chance I get to help them build their ability. I do notice there is some territorialism and environmental fields in Trinidad and Tobago, and that does no one any good. So if you're established, one of the best things you can do if you're a young person and who's interested in this stuff, find somebody younger than yourself and mentor them and encourage them and do something. Pay it forward. You know the concept, pay it forward, the movie? Anybody see it? Wow. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Next slide, please. Nice little picture of Las Cuevas. All these photographs are from courtesy of Stephen Broadbridge, one of the founders of Trinity Eco Warriors, by the way. So thank you to Stephen. Next slide. So should you get involved? You're involved. So that's kind of a, not much of a question. You're already involved. We're all involved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's in northern China, I think. So here's global warming in action, climate change in action. Next slide. You can't talk about environment without talking about everything else, because environment is a gender issue. It is a woman's issue. Women's biology, we were discussing it over at our table. Pollution gets in the environment. It preferentially attacks women, reproductive tissue, and children. So if you're into gender issues, you better be into environmental issues. They're not separable. Gen environment is a poverty issue. Poverty and environmental degradation are evil twins. You hardly find one without the other. It's an economic issue. It's a national security. I'm from the United States. I'm originally from Berkeley, California. And obviously, a lot of American politics has to do with energy, climate change, and national security, and often to the detriment of whole countries abroad. And it's absolutely a youth issue. I mean, it, Biologically, it's a youth issue. Your future's at stake. The econ global economy is at stake. You want a job? Ignore the environment at your peril. Anybody in this room want to maybe get a job away from Trinidad for a while? Any young people thinking about that? Anybody? Well, if you don't know something about the environment and what it means in business and in politics and in your daily life, you're probably not going to get that job. OK, next slide, please. I said I'm going to try to scare you a little. This is, here comes the scary part. So big environmental issues, population, carrying capacity, water, public health. I'll go through these, but just notice consumption. One does not equal six. Would we all agree that one does not equal six? OK, very fundamental concept. We'll get back to that. Next slide. Disturbing slide, I think. <laughs> But what is the global effects of population growth in Africa, and what is the Earth's carrying capacity? How many people are too many? Maybe one? I don't know. I don't want to know the answer to this question. We don't want to ever find out what the Earth's carrying capacity is, right? But now that child is probably long gone. And so what for Trinidad and Tobago? I mean, yeah, it pulls at your heartstrings. 
But every child left behind in this way, isn't that an economic cost? Isn't that a burden on public health, on food, on education, et cetera, et cetera? So there's very little that's disconnected from you when it's a small planet. It's a very small planet, right? So even that, we pay, we all on this, we're global citizens, and we all pay a little bit of the cost of this sort of thing. Next slide, please. Water, water scarcity. We've had water wars in California where people literally got shot over it in the past. It will happen again, and it's directly linked to climate change because if sea level rises, the amount of groundwater and surface water that's available to do everything we need water for is going to be more and more infiltrated with saline water from the sea. So less water, less land, right? Next slide, please. And again. Public health. Okay, this, this is a burning topic in Trinidad and Tobago. I've heard some people talk about, let's do local food production, right? I don't eat anything produced in Trinidad and Tobago if I can avoid it. Nothing. I don't eat out of the Gulf of Paria. It's one of the most polluted waterways on earth. I don't, especially the oysters and the shrimp, don't eat that stuff. North coast, east coast, Tobago, maybe. Gulf of Paria, don't eat it, don't buy it. We've, we've heard a lot of people saying, what are specific things you can do? When you go to buy something, vote with your money. I mean, your vote at the polling box might not make much difference, but people like your money, so vote with your dollars. Go to the fishermen or the fish market and say, where's that coming from? Oh, we bought it from a guy in Claxton Bay. Sorry, I ain't eating that. You start stocking fish from Manzanilla or Charlottesville, I'll be back to do business with you. That, over time, that kind of informed consumerism definitely has an impact. Our local farmers, general, many of them, I'm not saying all of them by any means, they usually make pesticide cocktails, blending three, four pesticides together before they spray it. There is no way to do that safely. That's illegal everywhere. Once you blend them, there's no way to know what the biochemistry and the biological effect of that is. And most of our produce here in Trinidad has outrageous amounts of petrochemical and pesticide residue all over it. You shouldn't even eat it. You shouldn't even put it near you. It's that bad, a lot of it. Not all. I'm not saying all. And the water that they're using, for example, the Takarigua River comes out of Cora, right? Comes out laden with fecal coliform, human sewage in the water goes straight into the Wasa treatment plant, where that has to be treated back out. Goes into Tuna Puna, laden with um, petrochemical residue and runoff from the streets and the business. Goes into the industrial estate, turns into what is almost acid. It's, what comes out of there is literally dead water. Then goes south of the highway where farmers pump it out and put it on vegetable crops. Now the vegetables, remember, those bioaccumulate, they concentrate the toxins in the reproductive tissue. What's the reproductive tissue of a plant? The fruit, the stuff you eat. Then hose it down with pesticide residue, pesticide cocktails that are illegal and dangerous. Then haul it down to the market and say, here, feed this to your child. No, it's bad, real bad. And we're seeing the results. Now genetically, Trinidad and Tobago, because of your predominantly either West African or Indian genetic makeup, you should genetically be predisposed to hypertension, sickle cell, and diabetes. But now, in turn, and my genetics from Northern Europe should be predisposed to cancer. Not every case, but in general numbers. But Trinidad's cancer rates are skyrocketing. Some of that is from environmental causes. And I don't care what the number is. Somebody will say, well, you can't prove this and you can't prove that. I'm not going to have that conversation. We ain't got time to waste our time talking about whether or not it's bad to put pollution in our bodies. I'm not having that conversation with anybody again. If it's more than one person getting cancer avoidably, that's one too many, right? Now, this is straight from the Minister of Education. 30% of the new kids coming into the school system in Trinidad and Tobago today have our special needs kids. That's over 6,000 kids per year. The school system 
does not have the capacity to deal with 6,000 kids total special needs. And you're getting 6,000 new ones every year. Anybody here? How many people here know a special needs kid or a disabled person who's either got mental or physical disabilities right now? Come on, everybody, participate. Right? That's uh, looking like 20%. So we're in line, right? Uh, autism, ADHD, ADD. In America, we've seen autism rates increase by 125%, I think it is, in my lifetime. One in every 110 kids in America has autism now. New studies are showing, beginning to show conclusively a link between the stuff in the environment and a sick kid. So, you having trouble getting people in Trinidad off their backsides and get them interested about environment? Sick kids, if they can't get excited about that, then maybe you should be talking to somebody else. Next slide. Energy and global politics. As an American, this is a big part of our national identity. The cowboys, the police of the world, right? Um, next slide. In 1961, Dwight Eisenhower, when he was saying goodbye to the, to the country after being president for eight years, he had been the general of the army in World War II. So we're not talking some liberal peacemonger freak, right? We're talking a guy who made his career in the military, warned about we must guard against the acquisition of unwanted or unwarranted interest, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. Next slide. And here's the result. This is the highway of death, it was called, where in the first desert storm as the Iraqis tried to get back out of Kuwait, and American aircraft just basically crop dusted for human lives up and down the road for weeks at a time. Hardened soldiers were driving up this road weeping in tears and had to be dragged back into Kuwait to take them to the hospital. Also, most of the slugs there were depleted uranium, so now we have a nice cancer spike in that area of Kuwait. And southern Iraq, right? This is about energy. How we use energy is how we warm the, how we perpetrate global warming, right? See the connection here? Okay, next slide. And here's, an, this is very pertinent today. Here's President Ahmadinejad in Iran inspecting centrifuges to enrich uranium. And this could very easily turn into a shooting war any moment right now, including the potential exchange of nuclear weapons. He says it's for peaceful purposes. Other people say not. It's all about the geopolitics of energy, which is also about climate change, right? So these issues aren't isolatable. Next slide. Biodiversity, we were talking about wildlife in Trinidad. We had some, guy, I brought some guys on a tour they went to Costa Rica, and then they came here, and we toured them around the island, and they kept saying, where's all the wildlife? I said, in the pot. It's all it, you know? I have a friend who puts down $70,000 worth of citrus on an estate he has out in Mayaro, right? He wants to bring back his estate, reforest, have food to give away to food banks and people. He also has a squatter living on his land, but he don't interfere with a squatter. He says, not worth the fight. One day he gets a phone call, uh, your estate burned down. So he goes out there, brand new $70,000 worth of citrus gone, the whole estate burned to the ground, except around the squatter's house. He goes by the squatter says, what, do you ha what, what happened? The guy goes, oh yeah, I burned it down. Just, he says, well, why, why did you burn down my estate? Boss, it was a guana in a tree. Seriously. They didn't get the iguana, by the way. The iguana got away. The citrus bought it. Uh, so, but generally speaking, we have global fisheries are collapsing all over the world, right? So this means money out of your pocket, fish that aren't on the table, jobs that are lost. Again, costs. Dollars and cents costs. I'm trying to give you tools here that you can use to deal with the apathetic. For the person who says, ah, environment, that don't affect me. Well, yeah, it does. If they don't think it does, it's because they aren't paying attention or they haven't been informed, and that is one place that you all can have a big impact. It's just informing people, questioning people, rattling people, interfering with people, pestering people. I'm a notorious pest. 
the ministers all, oh God, here he comes. You know, but I don't care. Um, so livelihoods are at risk. And then, of course, we've all heard about all the medicines that might be out there that we're losing because we're knocking down forests. I've been through this. In Northern California, we have this cute little tree. It fit in here. It's called a Pacific yew. Always told it was a junk tree, no value. So when you're doing forestry, you cut them down, burn them, gone. Turned out that in the bark of that was a whole family of chemicals called Taxol that turned out to be very useful cancer drugs. So it's not always just in the Brazilian rainforest or some hypothetical thing. This really happens. Next slide, please. Here's a species that's on its way out. Has very little chance of survival. Their habitat's going. And I, interestingly, when I was a, a million years ago, when I was an undergraduate, our professors were warning about global warming in 1980, 82. And everybody said, ah, you just radical Berkeley liberal anti-capitalist alarmist freaks. You know, you long hair Berkeley people, you don't know what you're talking about. But one of them joked, he said, well, if they melt, the, if they melt all the Arctic ice cap, they'll be able to drill for oil under it. And it was a joke until last week, Shell and Chevron are talking about drilling in the Arctic. And here's an interesting thing business-wise. Lloyd's of London, right? Kind of the granddaddy of all great capitalist com companies. Came out with a press release saying, basically, don't expect us to insure Arctic oil drilling because it's a bad idea for the environment. There's no way to mitigate the risk. And you should definitely not even consider drilling for oil in the Arctic. Now, this isn't environmentalists saying this. This is Lloyd's of London, the granddaddy of all corporations, right? Next slide, please. There's a howler monkey from Shagaramas, I think. Next. Consumption. We covered this a little bit, but some estimates say that to maintain our level of consumption of everything, from water to posters to bags to electricity, we need three Earths just to keep up. But the developing world wants to consume at the higher rates that most of us in affluent countries are used to having, right? So if the numbers I've gotten is it really would take about six Earths. Next slide. Slide, please. So there's one, right? Next slide. One does not equal six. <laughs> this shouldn't be a very difficult concept, but apparently some people just don't get it. There is no future here. Go back. One slide, please. One, six. OK, I'll dr dr drub that enough. Next slide, please. Oh, I will tell you one thing interesting. Astronauts, this is this an anecdotal story. Astronauts are usually like military guys, engineers, real gung-ho, you know, not considered liberal, forward-thinking, radical-thinking people. They all go up there one way, and they all come back environmentalists. Every one of them comes back an environmentalist because they see this beautiful little blue ball with this fine, thin layer of atmosphere barely protecting it from the vacuum of space. Look out the other side of the space capsule and there's nothing but a black, hostile void. That'll make an environmentalist out of anybody, and it does. Natural capital. This is an important term. You're all going to have to learn it and learn to speak it. This is putting a value to everything that nature gives us. How much is clean air worth? How much is clean water worth? How much is flood control worth? A forest on the hills above Diego Martin provides us with habitat, recreation, clean water, clean air, flood control, maybe food, who knows what all. In the past, the debate has always been, well, if you protect the environment, you hurt the economy. But that's fake voodoo economics. That's myth. That's a lie. That's always been a lie, because all those things in nature are feeding the economy. One number I heard was it works out to about $12 trillion a year globally is the value of natural capital, about 20% of global GDP. I think that's a gross estimate. I don't know what the accurate number is. The point is, nature is putting a lot of money in our pockets and food in our pots and fuel in our cars. And if you don't value that, it's a lot easier to ignore it, right? So a lot of people have worked on this. Um, Dr. Agard at UE is one of the world leaders in this topic. You've got to 
brilliant person right here in Trinidad and Tobago talking about this. Next slide, please. So here's back home in California, mining for gold in the 1880s. They got a lot of gold out of it. To this day, there's mercury in all our rivers in the Sierra Nevada, and you can't eat the fish 160 years later. What's that cost? If you compare that cost to the value of the gold, all of a sudden the mining industry doesn't look as profitable anymore, right? If you make them internalize and truly pay, and the quarry industry in Trinidad and Tobago is internalizing its profits and externalizing all its problems. That's just the truth. Next slide. Here's a local guy who very much is keenly aware of the value of natural capital. Poor forests, high floods, high runoff, and his wall is in the drain and his land is going away. His, that land's probably out in the Gulf of Paria by now. Next slide, please. What's the value of that guy? In the, Kyle, how much do they sell turtle meat for? 10, 20 TT a pound? Right, so a 700 pound female leatherback might yield maybe 300 pounds of meat, maybe 1,800, maybe 3,000 TT if you're lucky. I guarantee you that leatherback is worth a lot more alive than it ever would be dead, right? And this great studies on this started in Africa when it was the first one to put in big game reserves in the Serengeti. And all the cattlemen said, wait, 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 you got my cattle are worth money. You're going to take my cattle off the range to grow lions? What's, what's a lion worth? So somebody studied it. This was back in the 80s or 70s. Even. Turned out back then that a lion walking across the savannas of Kenya was worth 1.1 million US dollars in terms of ec ecotourism revenue. A giraffe was worth 300,000. A rhino was worth 600,000. That was then. I don't know what they're worth now. Next slide. There's an ocelot. These, this is a species here in Trinidad and Tobago that's a very real possibility of being extinct any time now. Very few of them left. What's that worth? I'd pay, I know a lot of people who pay to come here to see it, but only if there are some to see. Next. Climate change, okay, here's the point. So there's still climate change skeptics out there. They're all funded by either the coal, coal industry or the oil industry, every one of them. 99% of the world's living Nobel laureates agree there is climate change and global warming and it is a reality. So we gotta stop having that discussion, right? Um, the bad news is that Kyoto Protocol said, well, we hope to keep global climate change under two degrees by 2025. Looks like we may have already hit that number now. So we're more than 10 years ahead of the worst case scenario, possibly. So if that doesn't scare you, I don't know what will. Next slide. This guy, I won't go over this, but Richard Mueller from my alma mater at Berkeley, he was one of the main scientists who was a climate change skeptic. He just came out and said, uh, actually, it's true, it's all real, and it is human caused. Next slide. Here's Florida, right? So just watch the bottom half of the picture, right? You see the lake, the Everglades, okay? Now, th my, I wave my magic wand and raise sea level three meters. Slide. Whoops, what Miami? There's no Miami. There's no Fort Lauderdale. There's no Southern Florida. Miami would be a little island down here on the bottom of the edge over here if you could build tall enough walls around it. Where are those people gonna go? 20% of the people in the world live within 10 feet of sea level, three meters of sea level. Where are they gonna go? They're gonna go marching uphill, right? You don't think that's gonna generate wars, upheavals, strife? This is serious stuff, and my generation has blown it. Sorry, but this is in your, on your table now. Next slide. Now, this is even worse. <laughs> this is the end of the scary part. Um, Scientist Anderson, his name is, yeah, from Harvard. This came out last week showing that there might be a link between climate change and global warming and ozone depletion. Because bigger, more powerful storms are pumping moisture up into the lower stratosphere, which is normally dry. When it does that, it's pumping up 
the residue of all the old refrigerants, the CFCs that were attacking the ozone layer, pumping it up into the stratosphere where it can attack the ozone again, but not over the Arctic and the Antarctic, over the populated areas of the world like Trinidad and Tobago. This looks like it's fairly sound science, and this brings a whole new layer to the whole issue of climate change. Next slide. Okay, good news time. There is good news, there's lots of good news. We don't hear it in Trinidad. I've been listening to people today talk about solutions and grasping for solutions. There's solutions to almost every single environmental issue we have now. They're available now, they're practical now, they're proven now, and they're profitable almost every time. So this is, this thing of either we protect the environment or have healthy economies is a lie. It probably has always been a lie, but it is certainly a lie right now. There's a ton of opportunities. Go ahead, next slide. Again. Markets are changing all over the world. Companies are going green, green procurement guidelines. Sustainable supply chain requirements are taking off throughout the whole corporate world. The green economy is not something that's out there that might happen in Trinidad and Tobago someday. It is here, it is here now. Not so much in TNT, but it's all over the world. Slide. You might, uh, there's a concentrating solar panel. Anybody recognize any of those companies? Okay, every one of them has corporate sustainability and green supply chain requirements built into their corporate charters now today. Two thirds of the biggest, most profitable companies in the world have said, we go in green, we go in sustainable, and it goes all the way down through our supply chain. So if you've got a little business in Trinidad and you wanna partner with Sony, you better be ISO 14,000 certified or they're not gonna do business with you. The best example of this, see Nike, Puma, Puma and Adidas? Last October, Greenpeace has been gunning for Nike for years because of their bad track record on employment and child labor, right? They find a Nike contractor in China dumping toxic waste in the Perfume River. And it's going in the river and poisoning villages and they got pictures of kids with blood flowing out of their nose. Public, public relations disaster for a company like Nike that's already challenged and that is selling health, right? Healthy, just do it. Bloody nose, just do it, yeah. <laughs> Sick kid, just do it. You go jog while your kid's in the hospital. Yeah, great. Nike, and, and it turned out Adidas is using the same company as a contractor. Now, Nike and Adidas both said, well, we don't use them for wet processes, so that waste wasn't ours. But damage is done politically and in terms of public relations. Two weeks later, Nike says, we go in green and non-toxic. Two weeks after that, Adidas says the same thing. Three weeks after that, Puma says the same thing. So if you're in business, you wanna work in a big company and you don't pay attention to environment and what your supply chain might be doing out there somewhere, and what your subcontractors might be doing, you ain't getting that job. So as young people, ignore this at your peril, right? Next slide. I'm not gonna read all this, but going green, these companies, I'd like to believe that these companies and our sponsors, and I do believe it, that they do genuinely care about the environment. But we know they care about profits, and they found that going green is profitable for a lot of reasons. Next slide. Right? It's profitable to be green. If you're not going green, you are falling behind in the global marketplace. Bad. Next slide. And why? Because it's efficiency. Environmental person and a business person can argue about plenty of things, right? But they're not going to argue about efficiency. Look at the, there's, I counted, there's about 120 light bulbs on in this building right now, right? In this room, sorry. Oh, I forgot the exit lights. So there's probably more than 120. Now, if this, comp, if this hotel could get the same delivery of service to us, which is light, but with half as many light bulbs, they make money, T and Tech burns more, less natural gas, and the planet wins, right? There's lots of opportunities out there, especially for innovative, smart people 
who don't just accept the status quo. This is where the young, nimble, agile mind that's sitting out here comes in. Where you question things, say, wait, why are we, do we really need all these lights on? How about if we shrink the size of the room? How about if we put in a, some of those solar tubes and run natural light in? That way you'd be half, le half as likely to fall asleep in the afternoon too, right? Better, con better experience, better health, and better for the environment. Next slide. That's a beautiful turtle. Next slide. Next slide again, please. All right, so what can you do? Slide, please. First, I would suggest you read the root books that the whole movement comes out of. Things like Walden and Sand County Almanac, Natural Capitalism, Silent Spring. It's good, you know, they say you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. There the, the environmental movement globally has a long, beautiful tradition, and I think you should if you haven't, try to get a little bit in, informed about that. Next slide. So, teachers, leaders, and heroes. Next slide, please. So we have leaders like John F. Kennedy, everybody knows, they're very high profile, they're important, they have a huge impact on the world, right? Next slide. Here's a quote from Gandhi, I'll, you don't need to read it, I'll tell you. A woman comes up to Gandhi and says, Gandhi G, I want you to help me get my child to stop eating sugar. He says, come back in three days. She comes back in three days. He tells the child, stop eating sugar. She asks him, why did you make me wait three days for that? He said, because I had to stop eating sugar myself first. Right? So it's about practice what you preach. So my point here is, you don't have to be, a, you don't have to be on TV to be a leader. You're a leader already because you're sitting in this room on a Saturday. You're already there, right? Next slide. I have been lucky in my life to have great teachers. Alan Miller was one of my teachers at Berkeley, and he took on the federal government and got them to stop using Agent Orange. Or it was a defoliant, a chemical they used in Vietnam, and it poisoned a lot of men and still causing health problems in Vietnam to this day. He took on the federal government and won. Single-handedly, he took on the U.S. government and beat him. Jan Newton, the same Agent Orange was being used in my lifetime on forests in America because it would kill the trees they didn't want and help the timber companies grow the trees they did want. Problem is, miscarriages, birth defects, mainly women. Jan Newton was a lawyer who took on a couple of ladies in Oregon as a client, sued the federal government, beat them, and that's where the EPA, part of where the EPA came out of, which is where also is the grandfather of your own EMA here. So you don't believe that one person can make a difference, you're not paying attention. Helen Caldicott is a great example of that. If you don't, I'll leave you to investigate her. But any woman in the room who cares about passionately about environment and a better future, find out who Kellen, Helen Caldicott is. Next slide. Here's uh, Nelson Mandela, so another very high-profile guy we all think of as a hero, right? So we have teachers, we have heroes, we have leaders. Next slide, please. This is Julia Butterfly Hill, I know her. She spent 738 days in a tree she called Luna. She said, you're not cutting this tree down. She's not saying anything about all the other trees. Well, she was, but she then wrote a book about it called The Legacy of Luna, which is a great book. As soon as she came down from the tree, the timber company said, she just did that to make money on her book, right? But then she said, uh, actually, when I signed the book contract, I already donated all my proceeds to charity. They went very quiet very fast because they realized they were messing with the wrong girl when she said that. Now, this is high-profile, dramatic heroism, eco-heroes, right? Next slide. Here's someone you never heard of. She lives in, what's it, Orialba? Orellana province in Ecuador. Grandmother, she's not literate, she doesn't speak Spanish. She speaks a Native American dialect. Chevron took over Texaco holdings in the Ecuadorian Amazon, one of the worst pollution problems in the world. She took on Chevron single-handedly and beat them and won a, lance, a, a lawsuit against Chevron for $9.5 
billion U.S. dollars. Right? So don't get discouraged. There are plenty of examples of victory out there. Next slide, please. And again. So what can you do? Number one, you've got to live green if you're going to talk green, right? I'll show you an example here. And it pays to do this. That's the, my little bottle here. I drink a lot of water. 20 TT. I did the math. This saves me 7 TT a day, six days a week. It works out to over 2,000 TT a, day, a year that this bottle pays me to carry it around. I got it at a Green Lifestyles show two years ago. Here's how stupid I am. I bought one, but I go through about two or three of these a day, right? I had to wait a year for my wife to buy me the second one. This paper here, this is FSC, Forest Stewardship Certified Paper. It works better than the stuff you buy at Price Mart. It's better quality, holds the ink better. Doesn't jam in your printer as much. Costs less than the Price Mart paper. And it's sewer certified sustainable paper. And it's available right up the street here in, in Port of Spain. Right? So there's little things you can do in your life that not only are greener, but actually pay you to do it. I like getting paid to be green. You can build green. You can speak. You can be a, bat, a loud mouth and a pest. You can write letters to the editor. You can write articles. You can write papers. You can recycle. There's a lot you can do. You can band together and lobby. Politics is what I deal with a lot, and it's frustrating. But you've got to keep on them. You've got to keep on them. Not everybody. I'm not telling you what works for you might not work for him. We each got to find our, our place in this. But there's plenty of room for everybody, right? And especially with a group of young people, I think it's very important to be disobedient. Next slide, please. Here's one of my heroes, Howard Zinn. He wrote the history, People's History of the United States. He says, civil disobedience is not our problem. Our problem is civil obedience. Our problem is that people are obedient all over the world in the face of poverty and starvation and stupidity and war and cruelty and climate change and biodiversity destruction, right? There is nothing wrong with some appropriate nonviolent disobedience. And young people throughout history have been change agents by being uppity troublemakers. I was one. I still try to be whenever possible and appropriate. Next slide, please. Here's what Gandhi said. Non-cooperation with evil is as much of a duty as cooperating with good, right? So I think our minister who was here this morning is a great example. Young person, junior minister, now in parliament, now in um, new ministry of environment, which I have high hopes for, right? She was a smelter activist. She was down there with her placard saying no to the government. No, you're not building this smelter on my watch. And look where she is now. So there's a success story in this room, right? Next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to finish with this. I'm an undergraduate at Berkeley, and we had to take this course called Introduction to Conservation of Natural Resources. You go in this huge lecture hall, like three times this size, every Tuesday and Thursday for 90 minutes. And the world's leading environmental scientists would come through every week. Paul Ehrlich talking about population problems. Um, Carolyn, C uh, Carolyn Merchant talking about gender and women's issues and environment. Um, Amory Lovins talking about the future of energy and, and John Holder and talking about energy wars and how American policy and energy is going to warm the planet and melt the ice caps. This is in 1982, right? And after six months of sitting in those lecture halls, you wanted to walk out go up to the balcony at the top of life sciences and hurl yourself off, right? It was so depressing. So my question to you is, um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that you don't eat anything out of Trinidad because of 
um, pesticides or pollution in the Gulf of Paria, etc. So where exactly are you getting your food? And second of all, how are you verifying um, that the same exact thing is not happening to the food um, from wherever you're getting it? Well, obviously I'm eating quite well. <laughs> My wife's from Shiguana. She makes awesome roti. I, I, eat, I eat great, okay? Right. Uh, I, I do eat stuff from Trinidad. But I'm just saying, you know, this whole thing of, hey, let's eat the local stuff, I, that's uninformed consumerism is what my point. I guess I didn't phrase it very well. That's uninformed consumerism. You've got to ask, where did that come from? What's in it? And the thing is, if you do ask, if everybody starts to ask those uncomfortable questions of the people they're buying from, a certain percentage of those people are going to start to realize, hey, maybe my business practices need to shift a little bit. I mean, you can check labels. And nowadays, I'm really happy when I see the Salinas, California label on things, which is where a lot of the produce served here today was probably from, although it's even there, it's not as well regulated and frequently tested as it should be. At least I know it's got some FDA testing has probably been applied to it. Whereas here, our produce is effectively completely unmonitored. I think, though, the point I was getting to earlier when um, I did talk about um, eating local is that we have the power as local consumers to demand from our um, local farmers that we don't want pesticides or we don't want fertilizers, but we don't have that power on an international scale with huge corporations, but we have that power here. That was kind of where I was getting at when I said we should, we, we have power here um, and we can use it on that forum. No, that's a great point. And yeah. when I go to the store in Northern California, I walk in now and the organics, it used to be there's like conventional produce mm -hmm. and this little piece called organics. Now in a lot of the stores, the conventionals are this big and the organics are that big and the price for the organics is the same as the conventionals but the quality, the tomatoes are red. When did tomatoes turn white? Did I miss the memo? Tomatoes are supposed to be red, aren't they? A lot of times, that's another thing is the green products, whether it's clothes, cleaning supplies, light bulbs, whatever it is, are trying to pound their way into established markets. So they tend to have very high quality. Mm -hmm. So not only, yeah, maybe you pay a little premium, but the, is it more expensive to buy that light bulb if it lasts 10 times as long as the other one, but only costs seven times as much, mm -hmm. right? So you gotta, it's about informed consumerism, but your point is great. And the government clearly is trying to push agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago right now. And I think it's the perfect time, I think you're exactly right to demand, hey, we don't want just any old agriculture. We want quality. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, this is just a comment on what you were talking about with Cropper Foundation on the value in ecosystem services. Um, if anyone wants to get information, this is just like a plug for the Cropper Foundation. We're doing this uh, project led by Professor Agard called ProEcoServe, which is the project for ecosystem services. And what that basically is, um, is looking at the value of ecosystems and how much they are worth in terms of national accounts. So you have your GDP, but you also have your, your economic value of your existing ecosystem. So if anybody wants to get information on that, you can look us up at the Cropper Foundation. And a colleague of mine did a very quick um, calculation a couple of weeks ago, and the northeastern half of the northern range is worth about 700 million, US, <clears throat> 700 million US per year in terms of flood control. And that's just one ecosystem service. So that's just an example of the type of comparisons we could do when we actually value the ecosystem. So if you all want to know some more, just check us out and give us a call. Sorry, I'm trying to show a slide that you guys could look at. Oh, and thank you again to Stephen Broadridge. One more slide. Keep going. I'll tell you when it's not there. Oh, shoot. Natural capitalism. I will le just leave that up there. Uh, if, I'll give you this information, but here's some books on these subjects. Ecology, Commerce, Natural Capitalism, and Cradle to Cradle. Where they talk about payment for ecosystem services, a different way to rebuild our economies, all profitable and all good for the environment.
Well, thank you very much, everybody. And, and please don't hesitate to contact me if I can help you with research or information or anything else. Thank you.